taking on to the work this morning. Appreciate y'all coming out. Thank you, Nick and Galen and, and everybody responsible for the meeting for inviting us. Uh, it's good to see so many church-going people. I can tell you're all church-goers because we're in the back. And I know that, you know, in our church, I joke, our people, the reason they sit on the back pew is because we don't have pews in the parking lot. So it's good to see y'all here this morning. I'd like to uh, share with you this morning about the drought technology that Monsanto is working on. Uh, when I go to meetings and talk to producers, you know, one of their first things they want to know is, is what's the deal with drought and the drought team and when's it coming? And what's it going to look like when I get it? And depending on the group of producers that we're visiting with, everybody has a different image of what this drought gene is going to do. Okay, a lot of guys that have the expectation that uh, when I get this drought gene, I'll be able to plant, you know, dry land corn in my corners and make 200 bushels. And obviously that's not going to be the case. Remember when we came out with the different technologies? Well, uh, you know, just the automobile itself. You know, the first automobile was the Model A or Model D. What was it, Galen? I'm sure you drove one, but, you know, whatever that was. And that was the state of the art at that time. But then, you know, we got better and better and better. So the same thing's going to be true with the drought gene. So we'll start out with what we call D1 for the first drought event, and then we get better as we move on. Um, so let's just get started here and see where we are. Again, my name's TK Baker. I'm the tech development rep in this part of the world. Live up in Dumas. There's my phone number. <coughs> Don't mind you having that. Be sure to call if you have any questions at any time. A lot of this is going to be redundant. Everybody in the room is going to understand it. But if you look at the overall aquifer, obviously this is us. Let's see if I get my corner. You know, down in this area, and these other areas that are uh, rely heavily on that aquifer, the brown or the orange or the different shades there represent, you know, the stresses on that on the aquifer, how much water we're pumping out. Of. Uh, so with these stresses and the demands of the metropolitan areas and, and all these things, we know how important water is to us and, and to agriculture. And roughly 70% of, of the fresh water consumed on this planet is due to agriculture. And North America in particular, we, we've been suffering through some dry times of late. I guess it has to do with, well, I won't talk to over there. But anyway, we're running out of, of water in a lot of places. So water is very important to agriculture, it's very important to mankind. So anything that we can do to be good stewards of that limited resource uh, is going to benefit us and, and in the long run it's the way we need to, to handle agriculture. Uh, if you just look across the world, a lot of these areas are, are bread baskets in certain parts of the world. Uh, of course we understand North America, some of these others, but these are areas that are also experiencing drought. And, and some type of climate change that are limiting you know, the amount of water that they have available produced also. If you just look at water use uh, in the United States, and particularly worldwide, this, this graph kind of illustrates where water is used. This green, the majority of it is, is agriculture. Okay, just produce food, fiber, and uh, for land. There's a little bit that we lose in, uh, from municipalities, from industry and just you know evaporation and runoff and these things but agriculture is a predominant user of, of water and if you could read that to the back you know since 1940 uh, we've doubled the amount of water that, that we consume and that's expected to increase another 25 percent by the year uh, 2030 and also just the, the demands of population growth uh, we're just using more water just more people to consume it so again, kind of a rehash of what we already understand, but what it all means is uh, just the increased human population is going to result in a greater need for water. Uh, currently, agriculture is the greatest consumer, uh, but there's a lot of demands on, on water from the metropolitan areas and industry and other things. Also, we're opening up a lot of land uh, that probably isn't the best land. We probably shouldn't be farming it to begin with. Uh, but the demands are such that we're going to break that ground out. And it being poor soils, you know, we're going to utilize water there where we wouldn't have before. And, and that again stresses uh, the limited bit of water that we have. But at Monsanto, looking at this, we've got a sustainable yield initiative, is what we call it, where we uh, would like to double yields and reduce inputs by the year 2030. When you think of that, you think you're going to double yields? Well, if you look just through history, we've more than doubled yields of corn and cotton and wheat in the last century. 
And with the introduction of biotech trades and all the science that, that we uh, have now, we, we feel confident we can do that. Double the yields and reduce the inputs, you know, fertility, uh, water, and all these things. But some of the approaches that we're taking to help that um, come to fruition is a three-pronged approach. First would just be traditional plant breeding. If you look at the curves, we all realize that we've increased um, yields steadily across time, a bushel and a half or, or maybe two bushel per acre a year, just for the classical breeding. Certainly we're gonna maintain that approach and we're gonna look for native genes, just native tolerances and, and resistance uh, to drought and all these other things in the classical breeding sense. Additionally to that, of course, Monsanto's known for a biotech industry. So we'll be plugging in these biotech traits and genes to help um, uh, increase productivity there and improve our agronomic systems. I can remember, it hasn't been too long ago, this time of year in the winter, uh, man, I was giving a presentation every week somewhere uh, preaching the, the sermon of, of strip hill and minimum till. And that's probably one of the greatest uh, leaps that we've, we've taken in recent times is we've, we've quit farming. You know, we've put the plows away, they're sitting in the fence row, we've got weeds around them, that's cool. Once we quit farming, we've been able to increase our efficiency of water use and, and, and uh, make great strides there. So three-pronged approach is what Monsanto uses as we move forward. To, to look at drought particularly, the different mechanisms and different ways to attack it, to approach this problem. If you talk to a corn producer in uh, Iowa or a cotton farmer in Georgia and you ask them what is drought tolerance, what does that mean to you, it's going to be quite a bit different than if I ask you guys in the room today what that means. But as we look at drought, uh, the three main mechanisms are kind of distinct, but the things we have to consider are drought avoidance, drought tolerance, and then just escaping the drought. So with one of these or a combination of these uh, mechanisms is how we're going to uh, increase our productivity and water use efficiency. Just another uh, pictorial here that again reminds us of the things I think everyone understands. Drought is probably the major stress, water stress, particularly in corn that we have to face in agriculture. Uh, you know, we've got all sorts of pests and we're able to control those with biotech traits or with chemistry, uh, cultural practices, different things, but drought is the one variable that we have probably the least, in, uh, the least way to manage uh, and it's probably the most significant. If you just look at a corn plant, for instance, and, and some of the stresses that it faces, you know, flood, wind, insects, disease, Frost freeze, all these other things, drought is still the major factor that's going to impact yield. When we started looking at insect traits to begin with, you know, we identified the, the major pests, and at that time it was corn borer. We've got a good handle on corn borer, and then with earworms and rootworms, when we move on. And with, with these insect traits for a weed, if you want to kill a certain weed, is a problem. You know, the chemists come up with a uh, herbicide and we can address that pretty simply. They're pretty targeted. Uh, typically there's one or two genes that will plug into a, to a plant species to, to alleviate or, or to kill that pest. And when we think about drought, and I'll get into this in a second, it's a lot more complicated issue. You know, there's not necessarily a drought gene. There's not like, um, I don't want to put this, to kill corn borer, and we plug in that gene that is toxic to the corn borer. Okay, so it kills it. This is like a bullet, boom, you know, and you shoot him dead. With drought, what is it? You know, is it root mass? Is it stomate opening? Is it cuticle thickness? Is it, you know, there's a million factors that uh, we call drought. So it's a lot more complicated, and I hope you appreciate that. Uh, as we look at this technology, there's a lot of factors you'd have to include. There's not a one, uh, you know, silver bullet that's going to take care of this thing. So drought's been a tough one. 